Chapter 10 The Treasure of Mac So, said Zale as he entered the forest with Boomer, how many soldiers did you take down anyway? Boomer held up both paws, revealing ten claws. Ten? Wow! Boomer shook his head. Na na, rekaka! He held up two paws again, closed them, and opened them again. Twenty? Now you're just fibbing. This time the Anthropanda opened his paws three times. Rakaka, yee yee, kakaka! Stop it! You lie worse than a Rockney spearfisher! They were notorious for claiming the sort of game brought in by deep sea fishermen as their own, when everyone knew better. Boomer hissed, his first standing on end. Okay, okay. Whatever the case, you're quite the little hellion. They came upon a glade minutes later, where rays of sunshine poked through the tree canopy and thinly spotlighted the forest floor. Here they found the monument, which Zale could tell had been cleared of vines and brush by his crew. Imperfectly black, like raw augite, the monument stood slightly taller than Zale. It had four corners, wider at the base and tapering all the way to a sphere at its apex. Zale brushed his hand across the monument, looking closely at its surfaces. Casper had spoken of some sort of riddle. As he perused, he started to hear a quiet pattering sound and looked to the ground. Boomer was urinating on the monument like a small boy might against a tree, were that boy covered in fur and a bushy tail. Zale cocked his fist. Boomer! You knocked that off! That's a family monument! Boomer scurried back, unleashing a series of agitated sounds. Go eat some leaves or bamboo or something, Zale said. Back at the monument, Zale found the words he was looking for on the face of the sphere. It said, quite simply, the one who succeeds will be in the know. Passed it down and in memory, the way you must go. Don't dare seek to enter that which no one can find, unless the treasure of Mac is locked in thy mind. Treasure of Mac, he whispered. The words made him shiver. Here, upon this ancient surface, was a direct reference to the rhyme he'd grown up hearing as a child one of few memories he carried from his birth parents, a rhyme he now recited to his own grandchildren, firmly planted within his brain. Quietly, he recited it. Treasure of Mac is not very far. Once you know where to look, then you'll know where you are. Oh, dear Mac, if you're here, thy great name is alive. Thy back to the river, then ten paces five. O oh, most brilliant Mac, the treasure is nigh. Your head must be spinning from looking so high. O oh, Mac, you great rascal, thy foundation is rock. It's dark water below, and below must ye hop. O oh, wondrous Mac, if here faith do ye lack, then ne'er shall ye claim the great treasure of Mac. Mac, he said, all along. That was actually short for MacPherson. He stood for long moments, staring at the monument in disbelief and trying to process this realization. He wondered if his birth parents had known the significance of this rhyme or if it had been simply a blithe recitation passed down for generations. Boomer zipped up his pants and stood, elbow against a tree, watching. Back to the river, then ten paces five. Zale finally said. The river is that way. He pointed toward the east. The monument is the starting point. So, with my back to the river facing west, ten paces five. He turned to his anthropanda companion. Come along, Boomer. Fifty paces for me, probably not for you. Taking what he thought to be normal steps, he counted to fifty. The trees became more spaced out, and a beautiful view stretched before them. The peak of a small mountain miles away, heathery foothills, evergreens in full spruce dappling the downs. Head spinning from looking so high, he murmured. His eyes started up high and worked their way down, where, more to their level, Zale spotted a distinct rock formation just beyond a grassy knoll. 
It started from the ground and rose in gradually ascending tiers. Near the top, a massive flat section of rock jutted out parallel with the land, perhaps ten feet above ground. It reminded Zale of a ship's plank. Oh, my foundation is rock, he said with a deep sigh. Okay, Boomer, looks like we'll have to climb onto this thing. Zale grunted and groaned as he worked his way up the tiers of rock. Boomer, of course, had no trouble at all, deftly hopping from one tier to the next. This is a young man's game, Zale wheezed. Finally, they reached the flat section of rock that stretched out over the ground. Zale carefully worked his way toward the end of it. His gut wrenched as he reflected on the next words of the rhyme. He slid his way slowly toward the edge, to where he could see well enough below. Dark water below, the rhyme says. I don't see water. The ground below did look darker than typical grass. Indeed, it seemed darker than even the surrounding grass. By dark. I suppose it could mean something more sorcerous, perhaps this void that Fulger speaks of. But still. I'm not hopping down into grass just because it's darker. Then, of course, he couldn't help but hear more of the rhyme in his head. If here faith do ye lack. A gust of wind rustled the trees and the plants below, and he thought he noticed the faintest hint of distortion in the darker grass of below. But it's not water, he protested. Even Boomer looked nervous. rock a -na hop hop he chittered softly. Yeah, Zale muttered. He stared and stared, the words of the rhyme and its warning about lack of faith playing over and over in his head. The ne'er shall ye claim the great treasure of Mac. Oh, he cried. This had better be worth it. His hop from the rock was meager, but it was enough for him to meet the quote-unquote dark water target and, as though an illusion, he disappeared through the ground completely. A light, comfortable breeze swept through the field, swaying the reed grass and adding some relief to what had already been a very long day for Jensen and his crewmates. Beside them, the Queenie rocked gently with the river's current, like an overseer of her crew. Jensen watched as Yancey led a parade of crewmates toward the ship with armloads of black Gukenian armor and weaponry. "'Someone'll pay good money for this stuff,' Yancey said proudly. "'Not sure who, but someone. And we might manage to score some extra barrels of food and drink from the fort before we shove off.' "'Yeah, man!' Wigglebelly said, dragging a bound-up mass of conical hats behind him. "'I hope they have some cheese! I'm in the mood for a good pot of cheese soup, man!' Yancey groaned and continued walking toward the ship. Jensen shook his head, clapping Fump on the shoulder as he went. Fump was a scallywag through and through, but his resourceful antics never hurt anyone, at least not intentionally. "'Get what you can, mates!' Dippy's voice carried throughout the field. "'Let's have the ship ready to weigh anchor as soon as the captain returns!' Jensen scoured the field to collect weapons and anything else of interest from the fallen enemies. The task brought him a wave of sadness over the loss of Tate, his fallen shipmate. He lamented all the crew members who'd fallen, but he had come to know Tate the best. They had often worked the ship side by side and traded shifts at the helm. Collecting enemy belongings seemed to Jensen like something Tate would have especially delighted in. When Jensen thought he had all the armaments he could carry, he managed to pile on one more small double-edged sword before making his way to the ship. Moments later, he stopped. He saw Starlina's familiar skywood hair, ruggedly feminine and enticing. It streamed in the wind like a stunning banner that Jensen would proudly raise any day. Starlina! He left his plunder of swords in a pile and jogged up to her. You came off the ship? She wavered a bit as she stepped off the ramp. I had to take this chance to be on land, although I admit it... Feels a bit funny to walk, almost like after having too much to drink at one of my father's homecoming socials. Jensen chuckled. You've still got your sea legs. Starlina scowled. I've got nothing of the sort. 
That is a sailor's malady. You're well on your way to becoming a sailor, I think. Jensen Carrick, have I smacked you lately? Because I rather think I should. Healer Fulger approached with a cordial nod. Nice to see you, Jensen. Always a pleasure, sir, he nodded back. Stalina, how pleased I am to see you emerging from the ship's hold. Some sunshine and free movement can be highly therapeutic. That's very much what I thought, Starlina replied. She took in a deep breath of the fresh air. Ah, so much better than aboard the ship. Sir? Ian Hopper shouted from the afterdeck. The deckhand pointed southward down the river, trying to catch Dippy's attention on the shore. Sir, you better have a look at this! Jensen and Fulger squinted into the distance. Dippy pulled his spyglass. Moments later, he lowered it, looking displeased. Elo, have mercy, Dippy muttered. What is it? Jensen asked. It's Seadred's ship, tacking its way up the river. Casper approached from the field, abandoning a bundle of armor. They'll block our exit to sea for sure. It'll take them a good while yet to make it here against the current. I can check if any of our maps show another way around, although finding much detail about the layout of Gukan might be far-fetched. Dippy shook his head. It's of little use, I think. Fulger's gaze was still aimed afar. Dubinon, please look to the land aside their ship. Frowning, Dippy aimed his glass just off the western riverbank. When he lowered it, he looked pale. His army of Grimkins has already disembarked. They're charging this way. All hands ashore and ready with arms. Or arm, Rosh muttered as he shoved a Gukanian blade beneath his belt. He drew his own saber and held it ready in his one hand. Yancey ran down the gangplank, having just stowed a load of their plunder. What's all the hullabaloo? We've got incoming, Dippy shouted. Ground assault approaching crew! We'll have to fend them off! Yancey adjusted his cap, scowling to the south. We'll whip up some surprises for these buggers. He turned back to the ship, shouting as he ran. Tonight we stuff our pillows with Grimkin feathers! Fulger turned with urgency to Starlina. Starlina, we cannot allow them to discover you are here. You are an especially valuable target and therefore in great danger. Starlina furrowed her brow. What are you talking about? Do you mean because I'm the captain's daughter? Yes, but much more than that. You descend from the line of Macpherson from ancient legend, the one who sealed away the Grimstone. Only one of his bloodline can claim it. Jensen tensed, taking a step towards Starlina. They might try to use Starlina to retrieve it before Captain Murdoch does, or if he fails. Precisely, Fulger said. You should go back to the ship and stay hidden. Jensen placed a hand on her shoulder. We won't let them near you, Stalina. Her immaculate blue eyes looked directly into his. Jensen, she said, please be careful. She hugged him and returned to the ship. Jensen readied a sword. I hope you have some more tricks for us, healer Fulger. I yet might. Fulger ran a hand down his smooth head. So long as this body of mine can endure, I yet might. Zale's breath rose into the air. Some hazy semblance of sunlight attempted in vain to pierce a vast blanket of unnaturally dark clouds, as if ink blotted the sky. It had taken him a few moments to recover from the shock of jumping into what appeared to be shadowed grass. Yet, true to the rhyme, it was like landing in water except he was unable to bob or tread or swim. He only sank, feeling like he might drown in darkness. Then he and Boomer were swept up by a current, and moments later they emerged from the surface of a black pool. When they pulled themselves out, they were completely dry. Under the strained, subdued light, the trees before them appeared as charred rampikes, like black, skeletal fingers pointing into the air. The ground around them carried an almost violet tint that Zale couldn't explain via any biotic or botanical reasoning he knew of. From the pool, they followed a beaten path. 
They were outside, but their steps echoed as if they were inside a vast, empty room of marble. All the plant life around them had full leaves and fronds and stems, but also completely lacked in color, as if alive, yet also dead. They walked slowly forward and soon heard trickling water up ahead. Boomer bounded down the path, lulled by the refreshing sound. Zale fought back to the few clues he had heard about the Grimstone's hiding place. Within the land where none may land, the Grimstone lies between what has been and what will be. He remembered Tom Scrubber's notes. The land where none may land now makes sense. But what has been? Boomer moved back and forth on the path ahead, exploring and sniffing about. The past? Boomer suddenly leaped into the air with a high-pitched shriek. A great plume of purple fire erupted from the ground ahead of them, just off the path. A freezing gust of air blasted through them, a sensation now all too familiar to Zale. Zale felt like his very blood was going cold, and not just because of the dark fire. Is it even remotely possible that we're somehow witnessing a glimpse of the Shadow Age? Shashati Rakaka, Mama Ta. Much, much dark, said Zale, somehow catching Boomer's meaning. Just ahead they saw the stream, which flowed of drab, grayish water. Boomer trotted toward it and leaned forward, about to take a drink. Boomer, no! Zale shouted. He picked up a stick from the ground, half wondering if it would crumble into ash or some toxic dust in his hand. Fortunately, it held together, and he tossed it into the flowing water. White steam surrounded the stick. Moments later, it became frozen, encased in a layer of ice. Zale and Boomer watched it in stunned silence as it floated away. Assume absolutely nothing is safe, Zale said. Just stay to the path. Peals of thunder rumbled in the air. Jagged forks of lightning stabbed through the layers of clouds above them. Dark fire bursts continued at random, but never on the path. If they did not stray from the path, Zale reasoned, they would be safe. Eventually, the path passed through a copse of lifeless trees and came to an end at the entrance to an old stone building, like an ancient temple. Three steps led into its gaping mouth which was as a black vacuum of lightless air. Zale looked around for any hint of flamethyst that could be struck for fire, but he knew it would be a lost cause. In this land, any agent of natural light was banished. He slowly walked up the three steps, Boomer by his side. As he passed the threshold, a large torch burst into life with the bright purple flame of dark fire. Warily, Zale took hold of the torch, feeling an enormous sense of discomfort that he now must rely on the deathly fire for his source of light. He continued into the rectangular corridor. The treasure of Mac is not very far. The words slithered through the air and straight into his ears. Zale froze. His torch went out. Such a thick blackness surrounded him that he felt near suffocating. The treasure of Mac is not very far. Zale's breathing was loud in the stillness. Boomer's rapid breaths were even louder. Once you know where to look, Zale spoke into the darkness, then you'll know where you are. Another torch mounted upon the wall ignited. Zale grabbed it and kept going. O oh, wondrous Mac, if faith do ye lack, the voice said. The ne'er shall ye claim the great treasure of Mac, Zale said. A circle of dark fire flames within small buckets came to life, one by one, until they completely encircled a stone pedestal with a small cylindrical object on top. It hovered just above the stone, encased within a translucent purple orb. The grim stone, Zale whispered. To be honest, it's smaller than I expected. Words were engraved in the floor before the pedestal. Zale read them aloud. I now reveal, to this rhyme there is more. You've passed through the dark days of centuries four. Behold the pedestal of ancestral fame, 
a power such that none can contain. Before thy quest can finally end with the treasure, let us see what thou dost intend. He approached cautiously, glancing around the room. Images on the wall to his left showed a man standing before this very pedestal, placing his hand over the top of the orb. I take it this is a pictograph, an instruction, Zale said. According to the last part of that rhyme, it wants to see my intentions. Hmm. Be nice to know what happens if it doesn't approve. The next picture showed the man with closed eyes and rays shooting from his head. Apparently, light's going to beam out of old Pop-Pop's head. Should be quite the show. Boomer pointed at the rays in the last picture. With a cackle, he said, <laughs> Boom, boom, boom! Ka -ka -ka! Well, that's comforting, thanks. Zale rolled back his shoulders. He took a deep breath. He held his hand, which trembled above the orb. Okay, let's get this done. He rested his hand fully upon the orb. His body seized for a moment as the energy took hold of him, and his eyes closed. He saw visions of handing the grimstone to Vidimir, Fulger watching from afar with folded arms. His crew received the single greatest payout in the history of the entire guild, shattering the mastery bar with fanfare and joyous celebration. Zale opened his eyes. A flamethyst torch ignited on the wall to his right, where he saw more words. To reach this place, thou hast walked in the past. Before ye can leave, must ye see what comes last. A wall in the darkness beyond the pedestal slowly raised, the stone grinding loudly with its movement. Zale swallowed through a dry throat. It seems we must first see what's beyond here. Boomer chittered softly by his side, and together they walked into the darkness. Jensen stood firm and close with the rest of Murdoch's crew beside the river as the feathery horde charged toward them with their dark curved blades held high. Grimkin's squawks and screeches blended with the steely clangs of weaponry, forming the chaotic chorus of battle. A few of the deckhands had pulled away the gangway to make boarding the Queenie less convenient should any of the enemies get near enough. Seedred's actual crew of humans had not deigned to risk their own skins in battle. That's what these hired Grimkin goons were for. Ruthless as Seedred's reputation might have been, in this way he was a true coward. Armed with one of the Gukanian swords, Jensen swung with all his might into the blade of one Grimkin. The bird-like Cretan was quick and agile, but Jensen found that his swings were stronger. He backed his opponent down toward the edge of the riverbank. It stumbled, and Jensen slashed its torso with a final kick into the water. Meanwhile, Yancey and Rosh, who were aboard the ship, had rigged together some sort of catapult device. Look out below! Bump called. Small barrels launched from the ship extra barrels of pitch that Yancey was notorious for loading prior to any voyage. It's for sticky situations, he was known to say. Most of the barrels shattered upon the ground, confounding several Grimkins who stumbled into the gummy tar. Other barrels crashed directly upon enemy heads with sundered timbers and splashes of black goop. Fire! Rosh shouted. Flaming arrows soared from the ship, aimed wherever the pitch had fallen, dappling the battlefield with fiery patches and inflaming grimkins, who flailed and squawked in panic. Thump and Chim cackled with glee. Shortly after, Hookney fired a six-foot whaling harpoon from the ship's ballista, impaling the heads of two grimkins and the arm of a third, pinning them to the ground. Wigglebelly chuckled from behind one of the ship's crossbows. <laughs> I got one, man! Yvette had both hands upon a club and yelled out with every swing, bludgeoning skulls and cracking limbs. Her four oarsmen held their own with Vulcanian swords. Falger was nimble and deadly with his Novidian dagger, striking down three foes within seconds. The fallen cutlasses of those Grimkins flew through the air, directed by Falger, and slew three more. The crew of Murdoch seemed to have the upper hand in this battle, with minimal injuries and most of the Grimkins subdued. 
As Jensen took down another opponent with a fist and a pommel to its beak jaw, he realized that a small wave of Grimkins had stayed back. He glimpsed a particularly hard-eyed Grimkin dressed in dark red, tall and burly, holding a sword in the air and speaking orders to its comrades. They lined up, moving their arms in a most peculiar pattern, as though drawing rectangles in the air. When the violet light hit his eyes, he knew what was coming. Dark fire! He shouted. Everyone, stay behind me! Fogger ordered, bounding forward. Fogger's dagger was surrounded in ghostly, pulsating light, brighter than ever before. He stooped low, pointing his dagger at the ground to his left. Standing, he swept it through the air above his head, like the path of a rising and setting sun. He lowered himself again, completing the dagger's path at the ground to his right. Purple fireball shot out from the line of Grimkins, soaring in their direction. An odd ripple emitted from where Fulger stood, like the momentary shudder of a filmy wall between the crew and the Grimkins. Then Fulger pointed his Novidian toward the incoming fireballs, as many as he could catch. One by one, a barely visible field of energy surrounded the dark fire bursts, suspending them in midair. With intense effort, Fogger turned them in different directions away from the crew and some right back into the Grimkins. Fogger dropped to his knees, breathing heavily. The return fire had taken down only a few of the remaining Grimkins. The twenty or so that remained charged ahead at the order of their commander. Jensen readied himself for more combat, eyeing one of the Grimkins coming his way. That Grimkin suddenly became invisible. Fulger stood back up, shouting, Look out, crew of Murdoch! These foes are channeling powers of the void using burn! Zaps of electric energy shot out from Fulger's dagger, striking several of the Grimkins, despite their invisibility. With each successful strike came a puff of black and purple dust. Jensen stared at Fulger, stupefied by what was happening, his mouth hanging agape. Fulger glanced back at him. I strike for their burn, he said. Jensen's crewmates flailed about and swung weapons against unseen foes. His heart racing, Jensen shuffled backwards, step by step, wondering if something he couldn't perceive was about to pounce. In short intervals, he swung his sword all around him, desperately hoping to thwart any surprise attack. Cal and Fritz just disappeared, screamed Yvette. She kicked at the air before her and was rewarded by the sharp squawk of a winded Grimkin. It lost its invisibility and raised its downy hands in defense, but it was too late to stop Yvette's club from wrapping it across the beak. Despite this, her coxswain's mates did not reappear. In fact, to Jensen's horror, he saw more of their crew disappearing all around. Miles, Kelvin, deckhands Abel and Jonas, more and more just gone in an instant. The rest of Yvette's oarsmen vanished, soon followed by Yvette herself. All over the battlefield, small clouds of dirt rose into the air, kicked up by crewmates being dragged away. What in hell's blazes is happening here? shouted Casper. Moments later, he too vanished, his strangled shouts and curses diminishing with unseen distance. It was all happening so fast. All Jensen could do was swing aimlessly, hoping to strike a foe before it struck him. Fulger tackled one Grimkin to the ground, its visibility faltering. He ripped away a black stone from around its neck and electrocuted the Grimkin with his dagger. His smooth head glistened with sweat. He frantically looked around at the ever-worsening scene. Yancey, Rosh, and mates Ian and Rowan clung to ropes and swung from the ship's deck into the fray below. It wasn't long before Ian and Rowan also disappeared. Rosh spun neatly around and clobbered a Grimkin behind its head with the blunt end of his sword. As he raised it for another strike, he was hit from behind. Rosh yelled in pain, dropped the sword, and disappeared a second later. Yancey fought with a stylistic fervor rarely seen in merchants or sailors. He swung wide with a spear and turned to pin it into the chest of a Grimkin like a javelin in a throwing tournament. Tiny dirks seemed to materialize in his hands, pulled from concealed areas all around his clothing. Jensen squinted at the slightest distortion careening toward Thump. He charged forward into its path. He slammed into the form, eliciting an angered squawk of surprise. The impact was a shock to his senses. 
He saw the grass mash down where the creature landed and tumbled over the riverbank. Look at you surviving and being brave, said Yancey. Then he also disappeared into a shouting distortion of air. Jensen stumbled back and swung his sword wildly. He heard splashes from the river behind him and realized that the Grimkin he'd just charged was coming back for vengeance. Stay back, devil, he yelled. Suddenly, a crossbow bolt struck it, and the wet anomaly gave an undignified death screech. The bolt stayed in midair, its front half crimsoned with blood. Then it swayed and fell, with a now visible Grimkin back into the water. Jensen looked up at the ship. Starlina stood behind one of the crossbows. Wonderful shot, my lady, Jensen called. Oh, I got it, she cheered. She loaded another bolt. With most of the crew now gone, the remaining Grimkins abandoned their invisibility and focused their strength on capturing everyone else. Most of them were preoccupied with a group of deckhands that had stayed close together throughout the fight. Fulger sprinted up to Jensen and waved madly up at the ship. Stalina, you must get to safety! You clearly need some help, she called back. This was enough to redirect the Grimkins' attention. Their commander shouted out in their chittering language. A half dozen of the Cretans raised the gangway into position and rushed toward the deck. No! Jensen cried out, dashing after them. Fulger followed, moving much slower than before. In his frenzy, Jensen flung the first Grimkin he reached into the river with only his hands. With the next one, he locked blades, striking up, down, side to side. The Grimkin struggled, despite having the higher position upon the gangway. Jensen won a slash to its arm and gave it a hard push, so that it pounded into the hull before splashing into the water. Fulger zapped the next one, but it was a much weaker jolt than what Jensen had witnessed earlier. It was still enough for Fulger to finish the job with a stab to the chest. The glow of his Novidian analase, however, had faded. Starlina's scream pierced the air. One of the Grimkins now on the deck had managed to grab her before she could escape below deck. A giant soup pot flew from the steps of the quarterdeck and into the head of the Grimkin holding Starlina. It loosened its grip and crumpled down the stairs to the lower deck. Wigglebelly approached, wiping his hands together. Take that, man! Grimy, grisly feather noggins! Another Grimkin was right there to grab Starlina before she could get away. One of them kicked Wigglebelly in the gut. He bent over and was knocked to the deck. The remaining three Grimkins tackled Jensen and Fulger and held them firmly to the deck. Before they knew it, Jensen, Fulger, Jackson, and Starlina, the last standing of Murdoch's crew, were firmly bound in rope and fishing net. As the rope was tightened, Fulger dropped his dagger to the deck. Let us go, screamed Starlina. Release us, Jensen shouted. This will not end well for you, my feathered friends, said Fulger. Wigglebelly only wheezed and whimpered. The Grimkin commander circled them. Its dark eyes narrowed and its beaked mouth stretched in grim amusement. As he passed by Fulger, he snatched the analase from the deck and gazed over it curiously. The commander retrieved a parchment from within its dark red tunic. He unfolded it, laid it against the mast, and pinned it with the analase. His wicked eyes seemed to laugh at their plight. He twittered further orders to his subordinates before the last of Murdoch's crew, including Starlina, were dragged away from the deck of the Queenie.